Then in January, the 5 o'clock restarts, but the 7.30 does until the end of it. And we don't have a Sunday morning Christmas Eve service, but we have a, I mean, we have Christmas Eve the, the night before, but Sunday morning, just be with your families. Father, we thank you for this glorious revelation that your son gave us in John chapter 15. Lord, I'm just awestruck just this last year of spending two semesters line by line, verse by verse through John chapter 15. I thank you, Father, that you gave this teaching to your son, for he declared that the teaching that he gave was from you. Thank you, Abba, that you are thinking of us when you inspired him to say these words that would strengthen us even for such a time as this. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, this is the end of our second semester on John chapter 15. And when we take back up in about a month plus, we're going to jump into John 16 in the spring and then on into John 17 in the summer and the fall. We'll just see, you know, how many weeks we give on that. But 2023, we're going to lock into John 16 and 17, line by line, phrase by phrase. Well, this uh, session 15 of our second semester on John 15 is our spiritual identity. And Jesus uh, 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 declares this actually on the Tuesday before the upper room, before the Last Supper. But at the Last Supper, he says this truth, but he says it in a reverse way. And I'll get there in just a moment. Paragraph A. First, we're going to start and outline the three reasons why Jesus said that the world would hate his disciples. And he, he uh, understood that if we understood these reasons, we would be more uh, b emboldened and strengthened in the face of persecution and temptation if we knew the reasons for the hatred against us. Number one, Jesus says, the world hates you because it first hated me and persecuted me. And, and what he's saying here is no matter how you try to dress it up, you cannot get away from the fact they don't really hate you, they hate me. And if you're faithful to me, they will hate what you say. And there's no way around that except for just to be silent and uh, to not stand for what he says. And so when people hate us, some folks, they take it so personal. And what did I do bad? No, it's because of the one you represent. And it's actually quite a privilege. It's a great privilege to be able to be identified with him at that level. The second reason they hate us is because we're no longer of the world. Now, that's a new spiritual identity that Jesus is declaring. He's saying you're not of the world. That's Thursday night at, at the Last Supper. But on Tuesday, two days earlier, he said you're sons of the resurrection, which he's really saying exactly the same thing in two different ways. And because you're not of the world, they hate you, which means because you don't affirm and agree with the lifestyle and the values they celebrate. That's what it means when it says because you're not of the world, because you will not celebrate what they celebrate in terms of their values and lifestyle that is contrary to the will of God. And that really angers them that you won't participate. And not only will you not celebrate it, but you expose it. You say the truth about how God views it, and they hate you because of that. And that's what Jesus means because you're no longer of the world, because you will not celebrate what they celebrate in the negative sense. And the third reason why they hate they hate, the world hates Jesus' disciples because they don't know God. But the problem is they don't believe that they don't know God. They think they do. There's all kinds of religious uh, presentations and views that people have. And a lot of them even have Christian language. But Jesus said, actually, the truth is they don't know God, but they don't believe that. They think they do. But that's the reason. And the bigger point is, when they hate you, don't cave in and think you're some bad person. It's exactly opposite. Stand bold and understand the privilege that you're representing the one they hate, who's the glorious and beautiful Son of Man. Let's read verse 18 to 21, and you'll find these three reasons. One, two, three, as we read the passage. 
Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know, it hated me first. And it's not really about hating you. It's about hating me. And if you were of the world, the world would love its own. The, the world loves those that agree and affirm their values and lifestyle, even that's contrary to the will of God. They love their own. Yet because you're not of the world, because you don't agree with their values and lifestyles that are contrary to God's will, therefore the world hates you. Verse 20, if it persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But verse 21, they do all these things to you because they don't really know God the Father. Though many of them have a form of religion and they think they're actually sincere with God and, and right with God, but they don't know God. That was one of the most offensive things that Jesus told the leaders of Israel who fasted, many of them, two days a week and memorized the Bible and kept all these laws. He goes, you don't even know God. That was, that was incomprehensible to them. But it was true because they were so steeped in, in the pursuing of a God that had their biases and a God that agreed with what they agreed with, but had their biases. They couldn't imagine a God like Jesus because the God of their own thinking was a God that liked and was persuaded in the ways they were. Paragraph B, the world hated me before it hated you. Now, again, the John chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify that its deeds are evil. If Jesus would have just been neutral on defining sin and righteousness, if he just would have kept it positive and God has a plan for you, God loves you, everything's going to be fine, uh, they would have been okay with him. But he says, no, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to testify what is right and what is wrong. That's the issue that causes the trouble right there. Because they didn't agree with what Jesus said. So they hated him because they, he was exposing the truth that was in their heart. Jesus assured the disciples that the people of the world would hate them because of their hatred for him. I've said that again, but I just want to make that clear. And that he assured them, the apostles and, and us as well, they will persecute us because they persecuted him. Anybody that is faithful to say what Jesus says, I mean, even part of what he says, I mean, you read, you know, it's this been going afresh. I, I love to go through the Gospel of John on a regular basis, and I'm just alerted and just alarmed. I don't know if that's the right word, but wowed by the things that he said to religious leaders. I can't imagine saying those things. I mean, they're great on a Jesus movie, but actually saying those to real leaders in real time and space, I said, Lord, what incredible clarity, but boldness that he had standing alone amongst multitudes because the Father said, I want you to say these things to them. Paragraph C. Well, here's a new declaration. He tells them he's never said this to him, to them before. This is the first time. He says, you're not of the world. Now, this was a new idea. Now, the world hates his disciples because the disciples are not of the world. Again, they don't affirm and agree with the values and the lifestyle that the world celebrates. That's what it means. You're not of the world. You're not of that realm. Since you've come into a relationship with me, you shifted your identity. You live in a different realm you live from an entirely different paradigm and perspective now. Well, that's the goal you're aiming to. You've set your heart to. They were surely filled with wonder in John chapter 8. This is one of the first times Jesus declares. He tells the Jewish leaders, he goes, you are from beneath. I am from above. Now, remember the apostles at this time of John 8, they're not fully grasping who he is yet. I mean, they know he's Messiah. They know he's from God. They know he's anointed. But they don't yet know he is God. That's different than being from God. And that you're human and you are God. Like, they're just 
kind of beginning to grapple with this. And so he makes this original statement, and I'm sure that the uh, disciples were awestruck by it. He goes, you're from beneath. Well, everybody in the world's from beneath. I'm from above. What does that mean? I'm from the heavenly room. Okay, we know that a little bit. You're of this world. Well, that makes sense. I'm not of this world. And I think the apostles went, okay, we can kind of make sense of that. But the remarkable thing is now, here in John 15, he's saying, what I said back in John 8, that I'm not of this world, now I'm now saying it to you. You're not of this world. Your spiritual identity is about to make a radical shift. And you're going to have an identity that has some similarities to my identity before God. Obviously, Jesus has some that are totally unique to Him alone. For instance... I have here in paragraph C, his citizenship was in heaven. And what he's telling, he's going to tell them when he says, you're not of this world. He's saying, your citizenship is in heaven. And we all know that phrase, and it's kind of cool. That's way more than a cool phrase. That is, a, that is the centerpiece of our perspective if we're embracing New Testament Christianity. And it's counterintuitive to our human nature and to our temporal mindset. Our citizenship is in heaven. Again, cool statement, great poster, good song. But what on earth are you talking about? That we're, we are supposed to evaluate our life, see our destiny, destiny, see our rewards, our ultimate vindication in the age to come. Again, easy to say, quite a different thing to live out in everyday life. But they're going to need this reality to stand against the hostility that they're going to face in the world. Because if they're really sons of the resurrection, and their destiny, their rewards, their treasure, their identity, their vindication, their wisdom is rooted in things that unfold in the age to come, then they can be bold. They can be unflinching if they're locked into that. But if their identity is still, they're rooted and grounded in what their blessings look like in the temporal, physical world right now, they're going to be greatly troubled by the animosity that they're going to face. So Jesus is really anchoring their soul. or uh, They don't get it yet, but they get it later. He's preparing them to overcome uh, the, uh, those that hate them so where they can have a spirit of victory and triumph even in the face of being hated. Well, he's saying that his citizenship was in heaven. He was also making a statement, and I'm only saying it about him because it's about us. That's the point that we're making tonight. That Jesus w was saying as well, I have access to my Father's throne. Even right now, while I'm on the earth with a physical body, I have access to his throne. Now, in the, in the, in the new covenant, we call that we're seated in heavenly places. Though we're can be here on the earth sitting in a chair. We can talk and have access to the throne of God because we're not of this world. We're sons of the resurrection. Our primary rewards, not our only rewards, but our primary rewards and our primary vindication is reserved for us in heaven. Now, this is a, I find a very powerful uh, terminology that Peter talks about. And again, I'm really applying it to us, but it was true of Jesus. I'm just establishing what Jesus meant when he said, I'm not of this world, because it's going to apply to us when he says it here in John chapter 15, when he tells them, you're not of this world. In 1 Peter 3, Peter goes on to say, you know, years later, he goes, we have a living hope. And it's because of the resurrection of Jesus we have this inheritance that's incorruptible, meaning it can never go away. It cannot decay. It cannot fade out. It's an incorruptible, non-fading inheritance. And though you don't see it with your eyes in this age, it's reserved with your name on it in heaven. And Jesus was anchored in that fact. It was reserved for him that he knew that he would rule all the nations and all the favor of the Father would be on him in his humanity. And that he knew that was yet coming and it was reserved. That inheritance was reserved for him. And that made him steady even in the face of incredible animosity. Paragraph 1, 
by the new birth, by the fact that we're born again, we have joined Jesus' new status with God. We are now not of the world. We're living in the world of the physical body, but our primary identity and our primary treasure, our primary destiny isn't this age. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, now we have joined him in that uh, 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 status before God. Paragraph 2. Here, just repeating again. For the first time he's ever said this to them, at least in the record of Scripture. He's saying, what's true about me not being of this world is now true of you. Well, it's going to be true. Here it is on Thursday night. He's going to die Friday. On Sunday, a new era begins. A new season. It ushers in a whole new reality of humans with God called the, the resurrection. As of Sunday, you will not be of the world. And you'll kid, this is my last time to talk to you. So I'm declaring it to you ahead of time. And the reason I'm emphasizing this, because this is one of the great truths that uh, the body of Christ uh, is desperately in need of in this hour of history because we're entering that time frame where persecution is escalating globally in many places around the world is pretty intense, but it's going to be around the whole world and it's going to surpass even the persecution and hostility of the early church. But if we're anchored in these truths, if we know that the reason they hate us is because they hate him and we're loyal to him, okay, and that Jesus smiles about that. And the reason they hate us, because we're not of the world. We don't have their value system. And the reason they hate us is because they don't know God, not because we're bad or we're saying it wrong. It's actually you're saying it right. It's just that they don't know God. And if you can settle those in your heart, you can prepare yourself to be far more steady in the coming pressures. Well, their new identity was to be sons of the resurrection. What do I mean by a new spiritual identity? This is the way they were to see themselves through this lens. Again, this is counterintuitive to our natural human mindset. This is, this is by revelation. I mean, we read it in the Word, and, and it bounces off. And we read it in the Word and say, Lord, thank you. Show me more. I, I, thank you, Lord. Mark my heart. And little by little, this marks our heart. But it doesn't automatically come to us. This is something... We want to engage in our conversation with the Lord, this spiritual identity, this reality. A spiritual identity is the way they see themselves, but it's more than that. Their spiritual identity includes the decisions they make. The decisions that they make are based on the great blessings related to the resurrection. They believe they're making small daily decisions that are connected to the blessing and the resurrection. They see this. They make choices in light of that. That's what it means to, when it connects with them, that they're not of this world. They are literally sons of the resurrection. They have fixed their hope on that reality. Yes, we're hoping for a great breakthrough of the Spirit. We're hoping for economic miracles and healing. But our great hope is far bigger and stronger than that. I mean, we can have the greatest revival and the greatest breakthrough, the greatest healings, but we still die. Our, our ultimate hope that we're fixed on is that permanent, forever, incorruptible inheritance that we have because of the resurrection of Jesus. It is ours forever. Now, the, Jesus on, in Luke chapter 20, he said that two days earlier. So he's already laid this out to the apostles. I don't think they understood it, but he laid it out the foundation of this on Tuesday when the Sadducees were asking Jesus a trick question and, and Jesus gave the answer, but then he made this surprising new declaration that he said that talking about believers, those who are considered worthy to attain to the resurrection of the dead. My goodness, what a statement. Those that are considered worthy. Now, the first thing you think when you see the phrase considered worthy, we think of earning it. And we think, wait, salvation is by faith. It's a free gift. We don't earn it. And he's not using the, the term worthy here in the sense of earning it. He's using the word worthy in the sense of coming into agreement in your heart to the reality of what you've been called to. 
that you would say yes in your lifestyle to something that's commensurate with the amazing reality we're sons of the resurrection. Would you have a commensurate, worthy, proportionate response to this kind of privilege and glory that God has freely given us in salvation? Paragraph 3. Now, the apostolic gospel, or the New Testament gospel, I like to call it the apostolic gospel, the gospel the apostles made known through the New Testament in the book of Acts, includes the call to be anchored in the eternal perspective, knowing that our daily decisions have eternal consequences and eternal rewards. Now, I know I'm saying this like a broken record, but we need to. Right now, the the weakness of the church across the, most of the world, there are exceptions. It's that much of the world today has been anchored in the gospel of the American dream, meaning it's the gospel of, of uh, temporal, physical, natural blessings now. More money, more comfort, more health, more wealth, more ease, more favor now. And the truth is some of that happens now. But the larger truth is our ultimate blessings are in the age to come. But the New Testament apostles, they taught an apostolic gospel that did not promise people, guarantee them that their life would be easier and happier right now by blessed circumstances. That they would come sometimes and they would go sometimes, but it would be in the midst of persecution. But that's a gospel. That's the only gospel in the Bible, the apostolic gospel. But it's a gospel that's very unfamiliar not just, I was going to say to the Western world, but actually far beyond the Western world. The Western missionaries have corrupted so much of the preaching of the gospel over the earth by preaching this American dream gospel. It's all over the nations that it came out of America. And it's not a true gospel. And, it's, and the Lord's going to correct it, but there's going to be a whole lot of confusion and trauma as the pressure increases because the message has to line up with the New Testament apostolic truth, what the gospel of the apostles preached. And the gospel they preached is we make daily decisions that have eternal consequences. And we know it. And we love it. And there's eternal rewards. And the Lord's watching. And he's smiling. And we are good for it. That's the apostolic gospel has that in its core. I mean, it's bigger than that, but that's at the very core of it. Living for the age to come is foundational. If we're going to love God and love people, I mean angry people, hostile people, enemies. I'm talking about love people. I don't mean just love your best buddies and your family. Loving people, even hostile people, and loving Jesus, the only way we can do that is if we have a foundation in living for the age to come because we're going to do that in the face of hateful persecution but not only that, there's two things. And seductive temptations of the world. That's what the world, the two faces of the world. It's hostile persecution. It's hateful hostility, persecution, and seductive temptations. Those are the two voices. Those are the true messages of the world that are coming to the true disciples. And yet if we're anchored in the age to come in the true reality of the gospel, we can withstand both the hateful persecutions as well as the seductive temptations. We cannot walk through the maze of this world if we're not anchored in the age to come. It's, it must be the place of our primary reward and our primary vindication. I mean, I like, temper, I like temporal rewards and I like vindication. I like it when God vindicates me. But he goes, mostly your vindication is later. So just enjoy the little I give you in this age. Don't anchor your hope in that. Shift it over intentionally to the age to come. That's the word of God. Let's look at page two. Well, let's pause for a moment. And let's take a look at this word, the world, this phrase that's used in the Bible. That's used in the Bible three different ways. The world. Well, the first one is the one that the way that Jesus is using it in John 15 here, it says that you're not of the world, but he says they are of the world. And what he means by that in first John, look at chapter two, verse 16, 15 and 16 John, and verse 15, it says that we're not to love the world or the things of the world. 
Then he identifies that the things of the world, three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, one translation says. Those are the three main arenas of uh, seductive temptations in the world. I remember in my early days, I heard a sermon, I mean like 40 years ago, I was in my 20s, and a preacher said, this is, I memorized it because it was so easy, to, so I'm going to give it to you. He said, okay, the lust of the flesh, those are pleasures without reference to the will of God. The lust of the eyes, that means looking, coveting possessions. That's possessions without reference to the will of God. And the pride of life is positions without reference to the will of God. And so this preacher said, pursuing pleasures, possessions, and positions without reference to God's will. And I got, okay, I got it. Because some positions, some pleasures, and some possessions are in the will of God. But when it's not in reference to the will of God, but we still pursue them, that's called the spirit of the world. Well, that's the sinful uh, a part of the, of the, of the, uh, of the culture. The second way that the word, the world is used by Jesus and by the word of God throughout the New Testament, it denotes the physical earth. And, uh, like for instance, the command, love not the world is referencing to that first category, the sinful, uh, lusts. It's not a call to ignore the display of God's excellence in the world because we can love the world meaning honor God and his creation and so this command love not the world is not talking about ignoring the beauty of creation and honoring God for it that's not what it's talking about it's talking about the first category not the second category and then the third uh, way that it's used it's for the human race in general it speaks of the people who live on the world like uh, Jesus said, God so loved the world, meaning the whole human race. So there's three ways in which the New Testament and Jesus himself uses this term, the world. And each time it's, it's really pretty, really quite clear. Maybe once or twice, you're not sure which one it is, but almost every time the context makes it very clear which, which one it's talking about. Well, let's look at Roman number two. We're going to go back. And just cover this some ground again a little bit. Our identity as sons of the resurrection. <clears throat> Our spiritual identity changed radically the day that we are born again. When we came into a relationship with Jesus. From that moment, we became God, part of God's family. From that moment, we're sons and daughters of God. From that moment, we're the bride of Christ. From that moment, this other category, sons of the resurrection. That is our inheritance and that is our future. I have written here our perspective of life radically shifts when we see this new identity. Now the question I, I would ask, and my point isn't for you to answer it except for to your own heart, has your perspective radically shifted from the day you were born again? And some yes, some no. Because when I was first born again, it was mostly about, I'm not going to hell. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. And Lord, you know, I'm 17, 18 years old. Help me score touchdowns on the football team. Do good in college. I mean, I wouldn't shift it over yet. I was just so happy not to go to hell and that God liked me. Like, That's good enough. And Lord's go, no, no, no. There's so much more I want you to be rooted in. So I understand on the early days it's not like somebody is, most people are not born again into the reality of the apostolic gospel with the real truth of, but if the, if the, if the apostolic gospel is preached faithfully, then even new believers can enter into this much more quickly than, than others do. But paragraph B, the, the last sentence there, our perspective of life radically shifts. Related to our life mission, related to our eternal destiny, related to eternal rewards. Again, I, I've said that over and over, but remember, my main spiritual gift is repetition. Okay, paragraph B, similar to Jesus. This is why I laid it out a minute ago. Our citizenship is in heaven. We have access to the throne of God like Jesus did in his earthly ministry. He had access to the throne of God while he had a physical body on the earth. So do we. We're seated in heavenly places. That doesn't mean we're physically seated there. But that means when we talk from the earth, our voice 
shows up at the throne of God as we are in a position of being received at His throne. That's what it means to be seated in heavenly places. And our primary rewards are reserved for us in heaven. I just, I love this phrase. It's an incorruptible inheritance reserved in heaven for us. Now we've got to see that we belong to the invisible eternal realm, mostly. That's what we belong to. Yes, we're living in the temporal, natural uh, uh, world right now. We're living in it, but this isn't where we belong. This isn't our main identity. This is our mission field. This is our assignment to operate in the temporal, uh, uh, visible world. But our identity and our inheritance and our life is in the invisible, supernatural world, the eternal world. Paragraph C. I've said this a few times over the weeks that we, we, we want to live for eternal rewards. Because we'll have a resurrected body much longer than a physical, uh, natural body. A lot of folks, believers, they put all their energy into getting blessing for their physical body that lasts maybe 70, 80, or maybe 100 years. When they're going to have a resurrected body forever, but they never think about it. Because the choices we make here actually affect our position and our place and our experience even in the age to come. There's so many verses about that. Jesus said, Matthew 6, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. I mean, to some people, this is troubling because he says, lay up for yourself. You mean for the glory of God? Well, yeah, but lay up because it's going to benefit you. How can I lay up treasure for myself that benefits me in the age to come? By making small decisions day after day of obedience and by standing true to the message. The Lord says, you do that. You are storing up for yourself. Doesn't mean for selfishness, but it will actually benefit you directly in a personal way. Moses understood that. It says that in Hebrews 11, he esteemed the reproach of Christ. The reproach meaning the stigma of standing with the God of Israel. That's what reproach means, the stigma. He, well, there was, I mean, he didn't know the Messiah back 1500 years BC, but the God of Israel, he, he saw the hope. That he stood with, he bore the reproaches of the God of Israel. And he saw it as greater riches, riches than the treasures of heaven. Because even 1500 B.C. when Moses lived, he had revelation enough to look for the reward in the age to come. Beloved, are you looking for a reward? Meaning, making choices. And the choices, most of our choices, are small. And they don't seem that big a deal. And we make a stand for truth. That doesn't mean you have to stand at the table, you know, in the, uh, the college, in the campus cafeteria and proclaim, you know, Jesus is Lord. And the reason I say that, because when I was in college, we did that a couple of times. And we went to go preach and be like John the Baptist. And we all prayed. And every time they picked me to stand on the table and with a bullhorn. And we did it a few times. Nobody ever got saved. It was stupid. But anyway, when I mean, but we really did do it. And uh, we thought, like, you know, the power of God fall. We just got kicked out of the campus, you know. But, oh, well, we tried. So when I mean boldness, I'm not talking about, a, you know, a megaphone on a campus table. That's not what I mean. I mean in normal conversations, not raising your voice, not getting hyper and energized. Just simply saying the truth that Jesus says. And we don't have to prove them. We don't have to argue them. We just say them. And by doing that, we're looking for the reward. This is one of the most, uh, I mean, really alarming passages, statements straight from the lips of Jesus. He says, what, Matthew 16, what profit is it? Now, now we're talking to sons of the resurrection. What profit if you gain the whole world? So you sell it, you get a lot more pleasure, you get a lot more money, you get a lot more likes, a lot more affirmation, but you lose your soul. Now that's real dramatic, but it's not hypothetical, by the way. This is a, not a rhetorical, hypothetical question. Many people who have the knowledge of salvation make choices, small choices, that become bigger choices, that become permanent choices about choosing the world over obedience to the Lord, and they know the truth. 
And at first, as they're inching their way, they're going to do it for the glory of God. Then they get further down the stream, so to speak. They're caught in the current of those choices. And then they literally make choices and they sell their soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Again, this is not a hypothetical rhetorical question. This is a real question. This is a question for people who even have a confession to know Christ. I mean, a lot of believers, they're literally on that trajectory. A lot aren't, but a lot are. I asked the question, have you asked the question, what will you gain? What will you give in exchange to lose your soul? I mean, this came from the lips of Jesus. This is not poetry. This statement will be said to people on the last day. For the Son of Man, now Jesus goes the other direction. He's going to come in the glory of the Father. Jesus says, I'm coming in the glory of the Father with all the holy angels. And when I come back to the earth, I will reward every one of you that obeyed me in those day-by-day -day small decisions. Every now and then there's a big decision. Most of them are small ones. And I'm going to reward you for standing with the truth, with standing with me. And experiencing the hatred they have for me. But you experience it because you said what I said. Well, again, some of these things he said, I went, whoa. You know, they're pretty intense. We'll look at that at another time. Matthew chapter 5, the verse 12. Great is your reward. And I've said it over and over that Jesus talked more on, on eternal rewards than any person in the Bible by far. Way more than Paul the Apostle, way more than all the apostles added up together because he knew the most about them. Paragraph D, we looked at this last week, and I just wanted to slip this in real fast because I don't, it's a really big statement, but it's not really the main burden of, of this uh, message tonight. La on, on the Tuesday, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gave the parable of the talents. Then he ended it. And last week I looked at it in our last session, but I emphasized the negative part of this, this uh, principle. Now I want to mention the positive. He says to the, the, the parable of the talents, the guy that had five talents, and, he, and then he gets ten, and the guy that gets two talents, it multiplies. The guy that had one talent buried it, and he lost it. And Jesus says, verse 29, catch this. I mean, I take, put your name on this. For everyone, I love that word everyone, Everyone that has grace that's animating their soul, that's inspiring them. What do I mean by animating your soul? It's inspiring and, and, and it's moving you forward even a little bit. To anyone, everyone who has, if you will give yourself to it, you'll get more. Jesus goes, it's more than that. It will be an abundance. If you keep giving yourself to the grace of God, that little bit you have will become an abundance. But... Then he said the other thing we looked at last week for about five minutes, so I don't want to spend time on it. He said, if what you think you have, but you don't really take hold of it, you're going to lose it all. You'll lose all of it. And so, but the point I want to look at, not that we're going to lose it all. He, I love this at the end. He will have an abundance. I go, Lord, I, I want this, my name on that verse. He that has, I got a little bit of grace. I got a little bit of understanding. I got a little bit of zeal, a little bit of motivation. A little bit of hope. I'm going to invest myself. The Lord says, I'll give you more. I'm going to invest myself. I'll give you more. I'm going to invest myself. I'll give you a lot. Keep investing yourself in these things that I'm giving you. Well, let's look at Roman numeral three, top of page three. <coughs> Why we must not be defiled by the world's hatred or the world's temptations. Completely two different attacks of the enemy. One is the seductive temptation, and secondly is the hostile persecution. They're very different, and they come at us often without us knowing that it's about to come straight in and, and confront us, you know, directly. John elaborated on what Jesus meant when he said the world, the, what Jesus spiritually meant when he used the term the world. We've already looked at this, but just look at it again real quick. Verse 15, look right in the middle. Us. If anyone loves the world, that's the pursuing the pleasures, the possessions, and the positions that are not without reference to the will of God. If anyone's pursuing those, they love that. 
The love of the Father is not in them. That's a big statement. I Whoa. Whoa. What? For all that's in the world, again, lust of the flesh, that's pleasures. Lust of the eyes, that's mean you, you want those possessions. The covetousness of the eyes and the pride of life, those are those positions, that honor in life that's without reverence to the will of God. These things are not from the Father. Verse 17, the world is passing away. These lusts are going to pass away. But he that does the will of God will abide forever. Beloved, I want to just wash your soul with that. Those lusts, that position, that honor, that accolade is passing away. It will be gone in one moment. But he that does the will of God abides forever. This is John. I mean, he was the one who wrote John 15. He's going, oh, I got more to say about this. Jesus, I'm going to take this thing to the, to the next level because obviously the Lord taught him this. Paragraph B. So we must obey and love Jesus in the face, again, I'm saying it again, of, of temptations and hostility. It's the both and, not the one or the other. Paragraph C. Now James, who was the Lord's half-brother, they had the both, uh, Mary was the, their mother. James, the apostle James, he, I mean, he really doubles down on this. He's talking to believers that are in compromise. He goes, you adulterers and adulterers like James. Whoa, dude. He goes, no, don't say dude. This is from the, from the, per, the will of God. He was really direct because I'm delivering their soul from darkness. They're living as spiritual adulterers and spiritual, but they're believers he's talking to. He goes, don't you know that friendship with the world, loving those three things outside of God's will is enmity. It's enemy, enmity towards God. It's war against God. They're going like, whoa, like, what are you talking about? Beloved, I want to say this. You, you won't hear this hardly anywhere in the, in the body of Christ. I mean, there's probably, maybe there's a couple thousand ministries mentioning this out of a couple million. I don't know. I've never done the math. But you rarely hear this kind of, these kind of texts. And I mean, this seems so strong. Like, you know, if I was there, James, let's calm down a little bit. He goes, no, I'm delivering their soul from a great destruction that they do not understand. It's enmity with God. Well, that one mega church, that other famous ministry, they're saying it's God's blessing. It's not enmity with God. Which is it? He goes on to say, James says, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. Then he goes on, verse 8, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. You double-minded, meaning double-minded, part of the day, there I'm going to go for God. The other part of the day, I don't know. I'm going to get away with as much as I can. Then the next part of the day, I'm going to go for God. The next part of the day, I'm going to get away with as much as I can. That's what double-minded is. Two different minds, even in the same day. James says, verse 9, and I don't know that people really do this, but it's real. He says, lament over your compromise. Mourn and weep. Be sad. This has gripped you. And cry out in the grace of God that this grip in your soul is broken. Lament. Ask God for help. And, of course, all through James 4, he gives all the details of it. Look at, uh, I got a couple more verses saying the same thing over and over. But look at Titus chapter 2. The grace of God. The grace of God teaches us. Did you know the grace of God teaches when the grace of God touches your soul and it's the true biblical grace of God, it will teach you to deny ungodliness or worldly lusts. A lot of folks think the grace of God is empowering them to live in compromise and be okay about it. That's not the grace of God. That's a distortion. If it's the true grace of God, it's convincing you to deny ungodliness or worldly lust. Paragraph D. Now, part of God's grand plan for our life, and, and I, I appreciate it, but in my humanity, I go, oh, Lord, I wish it was different. But it, it, my spirit man goes, thank you, God. You know exactly what you're doing. Part of God's great plan is he allows us to be confronted by the things of the world, the seductive temptations 
and the hostile persecutions. We're confronted. And the Lord says, I'm going to allow you to do that. Because in doing that, you exercise your spiritual muscles. No, Lord, you said, I'm in this before you. This is how you see me. This is who I am. We're saying all of these declarations of truth and crying out for his help in it. And our, we're doing like spiritual push-ups. And we're getting strengthened while we're overcoming. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to let you face the hostile persecution and the seductive temptations. They're going to come right in front of you. I'm not sending them, but I'm allowing them. Because this world, this stage, I mean, this, this uh, time of our life, you get 70 years on the earth. Obviously, some more, some less, of course. This is the theater for which we prove our love for Jesus. You will never, ever, ever, for billions of years, get to show your love for Jesus in the face of temptation and hostility. Only one time out of billions of years, it's your few years on the earth. It's the theater that God has given us as a gift to prove or to show, to demonstrate our love. You'll never love him in the face of temptation or hostility ever again. Billions and billions of years. Well, let's look at uh, this uh, next passage here. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 20. If they persecute, okay, well, I must start with verse 19. The world would love its own, is what Jesus said. We looked at that a little earlier. Then verse 20, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep your word. But all these things they will do to you because they don't know my Father, in essence, him who sent me. If I would not spoken to them, they wouldn't have any guilt. But he who hates me hates my Father. They have hated me and my Father. This is... He's saying these Pharisees who fasted and prayed that knew the Bible, they hated the Father. Like, ugh. Jesus, where are you coming from? He goes, trust me, I know what's in their heart. They have a God according to their own biases that agrees with them. And that's the God they love. And they imagine it's the most holy God, but it is a God partially of their own bias and imagination. It's the God they want to be reigning. But the true God of Israel, they hate him. Because when he speaks the truth to them, they hate it because I speak it for my father. My father's making me say it. These are not even my words. They're my father's words. They hate me because they hate my father. They don't know that they do. Then he goes on in verse 25, and he said, all these things happen. This is an interesting thing, verse 25, that all these things happen so that the word might be fulfilled, meaning the Old Testament prophetic promise which was written in their law, instead of the, the word their law put in their Bible. That's what Jesus means. It was written in their law that they hated me without a cause. Okay, let's look at paragraph E. It says that uh, Jesus said the world loves its own. <coughs> now, the world loves only its own. The world doesn't love sons of the resurrection. They love others as long as the others support and agree with what they do. So in reality, they're loving the people that are affirming them. So in essence, going to at least their mindset is such that it will bring an advantage to them. They go, hey, this is the lifestyle I have. And guys, you're amazing. They go, okay, good. I like you because it's going to come back and help me. It's going to bolster up my confidence and my profile. So I love people who love that. That's what Jesus is talking about worldly people. But their world, their love is, is a self-consumed and selfish. And, of course, the world has an image of their love as being noble and sacrificial and amazing. But it's love on their terms that agrees with their values and philosophies when we have no right to have a definition of love outside of God's. Because God's the only one qualified to define it. But, but in the nations, in society, there's all these different definitions of what love is. And the Lord says, I did not say that. And they can say it all they want. It's not true according to what I call love. Now, the world hates believers because they confront them with truth. If the believers, most believers won't say these things, but the, the faithful disciples, uh, they confront them with truth and they warn them of judgment. 
And if you confront people with truth, I, again, I'm not talking about revving up your personality and arguing with them and raising your voice. I'm talking about tenderly, kindly, in a patient way with gentleness, saying the truth that God says and warn people that these things lead to judgment. They will hate you with a passion. Paragraph F. But Jesus said, okay, if they kept my word, they'll keep yours in verse 20. Now, this is important. Because he, goes, because he goes, I want you apostles to know, and all of you as well, us, some people will listen to you. I mean, there's coming a billion soul harvest. Again, that's just a generic term, but hundreds of millions, a billion or two. The point is, don't draw back in a fatalistic retreat isolationism. Like, oh, they're going to retreat. They're going to attack us anyway. And there's so much seduction in the world. I'm going to retreat to a cave. No one's going to accept me. Jesus says, no, that's not true. Some of them will. It is worth saying the truth and preaching the gospel. Because there will be breakthroughs. There's going to be a glorious breakthrough at the end. So when he says, if they kept my word, they'll keep yours. He's telling them, there will be breakthroughs. You don't know when they're coming or where. But don't retreat in some fatalistic mindset of isolation and retreat. It's not futile to speak the word of God. Speak it with confidence. And some of you, I mean, some of the most hostile will shift. And it will lead to their salvation. Paragraph G. Well, because they do not know him, Jesus explained why the, world, why the world hates them. He goes, they don't know God. This was probably one of the strangest ideas to the apostles. What do you mean they don't know God? I mean, they spent their whole life studying God. And they think they know God. Jesus says they don't know God. So don't take it so personal that you're such a bad presenter that people are mad at you. They're mad at you because they hate me. I've said that over and over. Many refuse to accept the fact they don't know God. That's probably the most, that's probably one of the more uh, uh, troublesome truths Jesus said to them. Except for the fact I will, you're going to be judged by God. That was even worse. The religious leaders in Jesus' day prided themselves that they knew God. Paragraph H. We looked at this last week, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. I have some of the same paragraphs here. But I want to mention, he goes, if I had not spoken to them, verse 22, verse 24, if they have not done miracles in front of them, they wouldn't have sin, which meant their national guilt as, as a nation. But now... They are completely responsible because I've made the truth known and I just demonstrated it with miracles. They are responsible. The point is this. Jesus is saying that you speak the word, but ultimately the unbelievers are responsible if they hear the truth, if they don't accept it. Your goal is to say the truth with gentleness and kindness. Boldness, but with kindness and gentleness and with a spirit of love. But what happens is when it's spoken... Many people's true nature comes out, and they make it clear they hate Jesus and his Father. They don't think they do till you say what Jesus says. Because remember, what Jesus says is, he said it over and over, my Father told me to say these things. I mean, I'm, I'm, he didn't really say it this way, but I didn't want to say them in the natural. That's me saying it. Jesus didn't say that. But my Father said, say it. Say these things publicly. And when I look at line by line, I've been doing that over this last year in a really intentional way, going, oh, my goodness. We just lose those passages because we don't think of us saying them for real people in real time and space. I look at those, I go, Lord, so you want to be a forerunner messenger? Paragraph I, Jesus said, he who hates me hates my father. Again, they love a God that has their biases and their values that they call God, and they fit it in with their scriptures. And then Jesus said, that's not exactly what's happening. Their rejection of Jesus, according to him, which is the spirit of truth, was a rejection of God. Many think they love God. Now, this is really heavy. While they're hating Jesus. And they're not considering that Jesus only said what his father told him to say. He said, I only say what my father says. But they hate what Jesus said, but they imagine they love God. Jesus said it's not true. They're living in a spiritual delusion. 
John 5, verse 23, he does not honor Jesus, does not honor God the Father or the God of Israel or the Almighty God. These, these folks that say, well, you know, God on my own way, or I, da, 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 you know, all these different points of view. If they do not honor the Son, they do not honor the Father. I look at that and I think, wow, that is just unyielding. Jesus said later, I mean, Matthew 12, if he's not, if he who is not with me is against me. The truth is people that mock Jesus don't know God. And no one ever tells them that, of course. And I mean, you know, there's not that many occasions to tell them that. But if you preached a little bit of this, just kind of put that in your conversation, put a little bit on your social media, you'll see what happens. Paragraph G, they hate me and my father. Now, hatred is a hard thing to restrain. When you have hatred, it's really easy to vent it when you have hatred. And the hatred's there, but the preaching of truth brings the hatred to the surface. And when that hatred gets stirred up, it vents quite easily. But Jesus is saying the rejection of him is the rejection of the father. Many, again, I, John 7, verse 7, I've shared it a few times already. Many leaders in, in Israel hated Jesus because of what he said to them. John 7, 7, he says, the world hates me because I testify about it. Now, these people, they don't believe that they don't love, love God. They think they do love God. That's the delusion they're living in. They oppose the truth about Jesus as the only way of salvation. They oppose the truth about Jesus as him having the authority to judge the human race. They oppose the truth about Jesus as his deity. They oppose the truth about Jesus that he has the only way of salvation. They don't oppose all of these things. It's not good. It's not right. We're not going for it. Paragraph K, we'll bring this to an end here. The very last, I mean, verse 25 he says, uh, the scripture, I have it written there again for, for your convenience here. I put it in, in the handout again. John 15, verse 25, paragraph K. But this has happened, meaning this hatred, this escalating, continual hatred, this has happened that the word, the biblical prophecy might be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Now, Jesus is making reference to two of David's Psalms where David's experience prophetically foreshadowed the Messiah being hated without a cause. And what Jesus is saying in verse 22 to 24, right before verse 25, the two verses before, I did enough. I said enough and did enough miracles to make them responsible. So they hate me and they have no reason to hate me. There's no reason except for the fact that men love sin and they love darkness. Jesus says one of the most difficult statements to accept with our natural mindset. He goes in John chapter 3. This is the condemnation. This is the negative conclusion right here. The light has come into the world. Just Jesus talking about himself. I've come. I declared the truth exactly like my father told me to say it. And I did miracles. The light came. But men love darkness. They love it. They don't think they love darkness. They think they love light. They love darkness. I'll prove it, but I'll say what the Father says, then their hatred will come to the surface. And the reason they love darkness, verse 20, everyone who hates evil, they hate the light. They hate the truth. They hate Jesus' message because their deeds are exposed. So they want to get rid of Jesus and his message. Paragraph L. So these prophetic scriptures of David in this, those two passages in Psalms I mentioned in paragraph K, I'm in paragraph L, worship team, come on up. The scriptures made it clear that it, they're not saying it was God's will that people would hate the Messiah. That's not what he's saying. Some op different. He's saying it's God was proving they hated the Messiah for no reason whatsoever. That the Father and the Son worked to give people every good reason to say yes. And so what the prophecy said is, they will hate him with no reason whatsoever to hate him, except for they love darkness. And they totally refuse that conclusion. God gave Israel, and of course many through history, plenty enough revelation. If they hate Jesus, they do it without any cause to hate him, except for their own sin and love for darkness. People around that hate Jesus, it's not because he's done them bad or done wrong. 
because they love darkness in their heart and they don't see that yet. I don't mean we're mean to them and we just write them off. No, we tenderly try to wake them up, but we're on Jesus' side when we're doing it. We're not agreeing with them against Jesus. We're agreeing with Jesus against their wrong mindset. Jesus manifested such a beautiful, attractive revelation of the Father. If anyone hates him, the, the scripture says, they hate him for no reason whatsoever. There's nothing in Jesus to make a person hate him if they will open their heart to truth. So here we are. We're sons of the resurrection. We know who we are. We're facing hatred. But we know that many are going to come to light. So we're going to stand in the place of hatred. We're going to stand in the, in the place of seductive temptations. We're going to pick Jesus. And when we stumble, we're going to repent and sign back up again. And we're going to stand and we're going to work that muscle as sons of the resurrection. And that many are going to hear the word and come in. And Jesus is going to be glorified. And the Father is going to made, be made to look beautiful across the nations by the witness of the church. Amen and amen. Let's stand before the Lord. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I knew, I knew you did. <laughs> Father, we love you. Or do we want to just get rid of this foolish argument, religious arguing that's in the church about Jesus and the Bible? Your word is perfect. Your son is perfect. Father, you're glorious. That's it. You're glorious. That's it. That's all there is to it. We love you, Jesus. Mm, Jesus, I love you. I love Jesus, we love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Your name is iconic on my lips. Your spirit is like water to Jesus, my you, Jesus. soul. Your word is a lamp to my Jesus, I love Jesus, I love you. Let's declare it to him. I love you. For your name is Iconi. On my lips, your spirit's like water. You're beautiful, Jesus. To you are the truth. Your word is a lamp to my Jesus, I love you. You are the light. I love you. You are the truth, and we love you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I love you. I love you. Oh, Jesus, I love you. I love you. Oh, Jesus, I love you. Testimony, Lord.
we set our heart to obey you, to trust your truth, to accept your leadership. We set our hearts to love your
feet like Mary and listen to your word. Receive your words of life. Are sweet to me. They are good for me. Oh, how I love you, God, and everything within me. is perfect. You have the words of life. I love your leadership. Your leadership is perfect. You have the words of life. I love your leadership. Your leadership is perfect. You have the words of life. I love your leadership. Your leadership is perfect. Oh, I love you. Oh, it's me. 
Oh